Okay, and good day, everybody, and welcome to the professors here at McMurray University. I'm Paul Fabrizio, and instead of my usual co-host, Don Frazier, instead we have a guest. Hi, I'm Christopher Bartlett. I'm a 2018 McMurray graduate. And, and he is actually the producer-director of the regular professors, uh, what's the right word? Podcast? Podcast. Yeah, yeah, Podcast yeah. and YouTube. Yep, yeah, the... Don Frazier YouTube channel. That's right. Yeah. So anyway, we're delighted you're here. Don Frazier couldn't be here today. He no, is... he's in Austin. Are we allowed to say that? Yes, we're yeah. allowed to say All where right. he is. He is yeah. in Austin. Serving the people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he has students on a trip there. They're actually going to the Texas Historical Society. They're looking mm -hmm. at the archives and also going to a cemetery and examining graves. Wow. So yeah. anyway, yeah, you, that's pretty you cool. did all that when you were a student, right? Uh, well, I went with him to Louisiana uh, okay. to see the, some Civil War battlefields, and it was very cool. It was very nice. Yeah. yeah. It, by all accounts, he's a good tour. Yeah, he Oops. is. He, very knowledgeable. <laughs> yes. But anyway, he's not here, so you're here. We're no, he's here with us in spirit. Yeah. That's it. That's it. <laughs> yeah. And today, we're going to continue talking with key members of the McMurray University mm. faculty and staff. And so today we have David Amlin. And thank you so much for being here, yeah, Professor. Yeah, I'm thrilled to be here. And it was great to get the invitation to come talk to you guys about some of the stuff going on in the music department. Yeah. Ooh, thank so you for accepting our invitation. <laughs> now, when we've had people talk about music before, we've had a history of rock and roll. Okay. My sense is we're not going to do that today. Not exactly with what we're doing, and uh, most of our music department stuff is going to gear more towards classical music, and maybe some on the American popular side with jazz and things like that. We do do world musics and things like that. We don't have a set class on rock and roll. I incorporate some of that into the music history sequence that mm -hmm. I teach, but we don't have a 100% set class just in that, so... Probably not strictly rock and roll today. Okay, nice. we're going to go All in right. different directions. We're going to feel more elevated. I yeah, think. a little bit. Okay. Now, David, why don't you start by telling us about yourself. Where did you come from? Yeah, I'm originally from Cincinnati, Ohio. Started band in um, fifth grade, like everybody does in Ohio. It's fifth grade here, maybe sixth grade here in Texas. Yeah. But mm -hmm. And then after that, uh, fell in love with music, mostly through high school. I uh, went to college at the University of Oklahoma, just up the street from my undergrad. Did my master's degree in New York City at a smaller conservatory called the Manus College of Music. And then did a doctorate at Indiana University with uh, John Rommel, great trumpet player, uh, pedagogue, who we actually have coming to campus next week on Wednesday to have a residency here. Wow, um, nice. So after that, I went to Tennessee and taught at Middle Tennessee State for mm -hmm. a year full time and then a bunch of adjunct work for the next following years. And then was offered the job here in Abilene. And my wife and I have been here for four years and we really love it. Very good. Nice, nice. So what is your instrument that you're most in love with? Yeah, so I mostly play the trumpet. Um, also flugelhorn and some of the varieties of the trumpet. I, I do teach uh, the high brass studio here at McMurray, so I also include horn lessons. But my primary instrument and focus has always been trumpet. Um, what, what, what do you mean by high brass? High brass is – so the, the brass section in, in a band consists of uh, high and low brass, so trumpet – and horn would be the high brass instruments. If we look at the low brass instruments, we'd have euphonium, trombone, tuba, things like that would fall. We kind of split it into two categories, mm -hmm. um, sort of because the high brasses are a little bit more aligned. The, the instruments, especially the mouthpieces, are a little bit smaller, and they play higher in the register. Uh, so if you think about a whole soundscape, uh, the top range being the, the high brass instruments, the low brass instruments would be the bass voices. So that's why we split it into high and low brass. Okay. Nice. Mm -hmm. You didn't bring an instrument with you, did I you? I didn't bring one today. I just got done teaching a lesson, and I stuck it back on the shelf and for is the your next lip, hour. is your lip sore or something? <laughs> uh, they're not sore today. Yesterday they got a little sore after I finished like five hours straight of teaching lessons. But <laughs> but not. I didn't bring one with me today. Nice. What is the instrument that you started with? Was it? A it was trombone? trumpet. A trumpet, trumpet, actually. Yeah, it's actually the only one I've ever really focused on. Uh, it's pretty common for a lot of band people to switch around instruments, but mm -hmm. I, I guess I, maybe I just got lucky, or uh, maybe I was just happened to be 
a little bit better at the trumpet and so they didn't think I needed to switch. Sometimes band directors will switch uh, instruments on students because they're not uh, doing as well. Or it was also a fact that our, our instrumental program where I grew up was very, very strong in Ohio. And we didn't have a need for people to switch around as much. Often mm. band directors will switch students because they have low numbers on another instrument. And so if they have trumpet tends to be one of the higher numbered in, instruments in the band. So a lot of players, young kids want to play the trumpet. They see it plays really loud. They can try to play high notes. They think it's cool. So they'll, Did you think that when you were young? Actually, no, I didn't know anything about the trumpet when I first started. And honestly, one of the things I, I don't like doing more than anything is playing high notes. So I probably didn't like to when I I was that that age either but um so a lot of kids will get switched around and i just happened to get lucky and not not get switched and so trumpet was kind of always what i always stuck with so it was handed to you and that's how it became a um, lifelong well, love and a job well the way it worked for me is they would have a day where you could kind of in texas the way they do it is they have a, a preview day and they'll hire some local people to come in and they'll they'll actually what they call fit the students for the mm -hmm. instruments um they didn't do that in Ohio. We were just kind of allowed to choose if we had an instrument we wanted to do, and then our parents could get us one. Uh, it turned out on the street above where I lived, there was a young man who was a soloist in the marching band that year. I was in fifth grade. He was a senior in high school, and he happened to play the trumpet. And so I knew he was playing the trumpet, and maybe that had something to do with it. Other than that, I don't really remember any particular reason why I chose the trumpet versus any other instrument. But it's obviously been enough to keep you with it. Yeah, exactly. And it's gone really well. And um, it kind of, especially in high school, I realized everything else that I had to do, I, I always did well in school, but that was work. And you get the trumpet out and that's just having fun. And even to this day, hmm. practicing, teaching lessons eight hours a day, it doesn't feel like work. It just feels like you're just having fun and playing music. And so it's kind of, I decided pretty early on in high school, I was going to uh, go into music in some form or fashion. Nice. How many other instruments do you play? Well, or can I actually play? Can you actually <laughs> play? <laughs> uh, I can play the piano just a little bit. Uh, I had to take a pretty extensive test at Indiana. Uh, not very good at it anymore because I got through the test. Uh -huh. um, I can make sounds on most of the other brass instruments that I would need to. I wouldn't say I can play them well. Uh, pretty much just the brass instruments would be where I would, would be functioning. So is there nice. anything you wish you could play that you don't? Yeah, jazz bass. Upright jazz bass. I think if I could learn to do another instrument, that's my maybe what I would choose to learn to play. I think that's really cool. I love listening to jazz music and it always seems like something that really intrigued and interested me. Um and I guess I would say if I had the time and really wanted to, I probably would learn to play piano better. Mm -hmm. Um, because that's one that it opens up so many doors and it's just, there's so much great music out there. So if I could play something a little bit better, it probably would be the piano. Okay. Definitely. Christopher, I've, I've spoken so far. Jump in. <laughs> uh, well, uh, you had the key city wins, uh, thing at, uh, church of the heavenly rest last yeah. week. So how did that go? Well, I don't play in that. So in, you know. in Abilene, we, so Abilene's considered the key city. Hmm. We do have two professional, wind organizations we have the key city winds which is a woodwind quintet so bassoon clarinet oboe um french horn and then flute so they had a concert sunday night it went really well really uh, interesting music we also have the key city brass quintet which is what i play in so the brass quintet consists of two trumpets uh tuba trombone and a french horn as well so or horn depending on exactly how you want to state it so uh we do perform there the key city brass is right now rehearsing for a performance at the texas music education association convention that's in san antonio in two weeks so we're we have a concert down there they do uh, what they call musical showcases you have little concerts where people can kind of mill around between sessions and then also as they're getting coffee or a lunch or something like that so we have a 30 minute show coming up down there in san antonio nice. in about two weeks nice all right so any viewers in san antonio if you want to listen to good, yeah. it's free, right? It is yeah. completely free for our portion of it. Parts of the uh, TMEA convention do require a badge, mostly to get into the exhibit booths and things like that. Most of the concerts are open to the public. But it is the largest music convention in the world, not just the country, but it really is a big deal. And um, our music department and pretty much every music department in Texas and even the sub secondary schools will shut down, essentially, and all of us will make the commute down to San Antonio for <laughs> 
about three days. Nice. Mm -hmm. Cool. Nice. Yeah. Did you ever think that you would go into music education? I mean, when you're, you said you made a decision that mm -hmm. you're going to go music in high yeah. school. And what kind of a decision is, where does that, what were you thinking you'd be? A yeah. musician so or I, I an educator? I probably thought I was going to be more strictly a performer uh, as I left and in, went into college. So when you go into college, in music, you have the opportunity to potentially major in performance. You could major in education or things like theory and composition at some larger schools. We offer an education and then a Bachelor of Arts, which is kind of a performance emphasis degree. And what we can do is... Uh, kind of discuss those in a little bit more detail in just a second. Very good, because yeah. we have to take a commercial break. You're very yeah. good at you that. You knew that. You knew yeah. How did you know yeah. that was I coming? I saw them waving at us over Oh, there, okay. So. Very good. We'll be back. Don't skip. Don't skip. Don't skip. Hello, my name is Christopher Bartlett. I'm the studio manager with the McWinney History Education Group, and you may be used to seeing my name in the end credits, or sometimes you'll see me sitting here as a special guest host. But right now, I'm here to talk to you about an amazing new opportunity. We have created a Patreon. <laughs> To put it simply, if you enjoy the content on this YouTube channel, then you can head on over to Patreon, donate money to us, and become a patron. And through your donations, more content will be made. Basically, it breaks down like this. With $10, you will receive a short thank you video from Dr. Frazier and Dr. Fabrizio. With $25, you will be able to take part in a patron-only poll. With $50, you will get swag. These items include a choice between two prints of paintings and signed copies of Dr. Frazier's books, Blood on the Bayou and Thunder Across the Swamp. With $75, you will receive exclusive videos that will not be available anywhere else, not on YouTube and not on SoundCloud. These videos will be just for you, the patrons. With $100, your name will appear in the credits. See that right there? That's where your name can be. Finally, for $500, we will send you a signed collector's edition of Phil Collins' book, The Alamo and Beyond. Yes, it is signed by Phil Collins himself. And remember, for all the higher donations you do, you also get the stuff from the lower ones as well. So it's pretty cool. And when we reach our goal of $5,000, Dr. Frazier and Dr. Fabrizio will give you their own personal ranking of the presidents from worst to best. Coming from the perspective of a historian like Dr. Frazier and a political science expert like Dr. Fabrizio, you really don't want to miss their ranking and why they put them in that order. If you enjoy this content and want to see more, if you believe in our mission of making history accessible to everyone, then head on over to our Patreon and donate as much money as you're willing to give. You'll help us continue what we're doing, and you'll get amazing gifts as our way of saying thank you. Now we return to your regularly scheduled programming. All right, and we're back. I'm Paul Fabrizio. I'm Christopher Bartlett. And our guest is David Amlung of the music department at McMurray University. We're delighted you're here. And there, there's, there's a lot of different things to say, but you were talking about the program that we have here just before mm -hmm. the break yeah. and about the different directions you could go. Yeah, so so I, I'm a entering college student, and I want to do music. Yeah. What so do I do? You you had asked me how what I thought I was going to do, and I I really thought I probably would be more of a performer. I was not all that interested in being a band director coming out of high school, at least. Um, band directing is a great profession. It just didn't seem like something that I wanted to be responsible for a whole band of kids and uh, go in that direction. I wanted to be more of the the person creating the music with my instrument. So I went into performance at the University of Oklahoma. Um, did you play in their band? Yeah. So I did uh, win ensemble. I did the orchestra there. I did the Pride of Oklahoma for one year. My first year, we won the national championship and did not lose a football game. And I kind of decided pretty quickly over that next summer that we probably were going to lose eventually and that <laughs> it was not going to be 
undefeated every year and all these great trips. And so, plus it took up a lot of time. So I, I ended up dropping out of, out of the marching band after my first year, but the one year I did it, you can't complain, right? No, so they no, took no, us no. on every single trip and it was, it was a great experience. Uh, so you go into college to decide if you really are interested in being a band director, which a lot of students are, you go into what we will call music education or a bachelor of music of education. And you'll be studying things like uh, your primary instrument, but then you will be taught how to be a successful conductor. You'll be taught pedagogy in um, teaching of music. So not only knowing the history, the theory, but then also how to convey and get students to do well in, in the band setting. You also have to learn to play every single instrument in the band. So there is a single class for high brass, there's low brass, there's woodwind classes, there's percussion classes, string classes. Even as an instrumentalist, you take a vocal techniques class. So part of your licensure exam, you need to be able to do everything, essentially. So yeah, th um, That's for here in Texas. That's for pretty much everywhere. Really? If you want to get a teaching license, you will take all of those courses. Uh, to be a band director because really you could end up at a small school where you are the only teacher for all of these students uh, sometimes from fifth grade all the way until they graduate senior year in high school so you better know how to play so you need to be able to you talk about percussion instruments yep. percussion woodwinds you need to be able to play them all you need to be able to convey to the student the fingerings for the right notes on that particular instrument so um that was not something I was particularly interested in. Uh, so I, I did the performance route and then went through a master's degree. I started thinking a little bit more about teaching as I went into my doctoral degree. Most people, if you're going to go get a doctorate in music, it's because you have some desire to teach on the university level. And I had started teaching a whole bunch of lessons the year before I did my doctorate because I was a finalist for a position in an army band, but I get migraine headaches. And so that excluded me from being able to enlist. Oh. So that happened around April, my last year of my master's. So it was pretty much too late to apply for a doctoral school. So I went back to Ohio and taught a bunch of lessons in a couple of different school districts. And that's kind of where I really fell in love with the teaching side of things. Again, not necessarily being a band director, but the one-on-one -on -one instruction purely on the trumpet. And so I decided at that point that that was something I was really interested in refining. So I went to Indiana. They had a uh, doctoral of music in brass pedagogy. So essentially being a brass specialist as a teacher instead of just as a performer. Mm -hmm. uh, you still had to take all the classes and lessons for performance and also do all the recitals. But there were also pedagogy classes where you studied with master teachers, not just on trumpet, but you had to study trombone, horn, and tuba as well to make sure you were really comfortable uh, with all of the trends and kind of the, the general thoughts in brass pedagogy in general, or teaching of brass instruments. And so um, that's kind of how I decided I really wanted to go and do the one-on-one -on -one private lesson arena. Uh, when we have students coming to McMurray, what I like to equate it to is if you were to go to a mall and you see all these great stores and you can only go in a few of them because certain degrees don't allow you to get in there. So basically, if you get a performance degree, but you decide down the road you want to be a band director, well, you need a teaching license to go to, into a high school and be a band director. Mm -hmm. So the music education degree is something we, we don't stress, but we, we at least make it known to the student that it's a very marketable degree and gives you the options down the road to maybe do a little bit more than a straight performance degree might. Mm -hmm. uh, university can give you a piece of paper that says you know how to play an instrument, yeah, school system maybe doesn't care about that as much if you don't have the teaching background as well. So that's the way I like to, to think about it in terms of the education side of our degrees. Most of our students will do the education track. Are they able to get jobs? Yeah. we Since I've been at McMurray, we have not had a student graduate on the music education side, whether vocal, instrumental, that has not either gotten a job within the first year or decided to go to graduate school to either further their performance study or go into something else. So we've been very successful at immediately getting our students to pass the, especially the music content area exam. The education mm -hmm. side does a great job to prepare them for the general education test that they take, but they also in Texas have to take a music content exam. And we have a very high 
pass rate uh, on the first time for that exam. And that's to show that they actually know the that music. That they know the music. So and in addition to teaching, you actually yeah, know what you're teaching You about. have to know, not like I mentioned, the theory, the history side, the instrumental, the, the actual teaching methods uh, that you might use. All of that is on the teaching licensure exam. And we have a really high rate of pass uh, there. I would say, I actually can't even think of a student that we've graduated that did not pass that exam when they took that um, because we often recommend they take it at the end of their senior year, whether or not they're going to choose to immediately go into teaching or not, because that mm -hmm. way they've already yeah. checked it off the list. They've, yeah. they've been prepared. Let's get it out of the way. Uh, so either getting a job as a band director, we've had band directors come out, choir directors, even elementary music teachers. One of my students from last semester is a local elementary music ed teacher now in our in AISD. Uh, so they either do that or uh, they decide to go graduate study into music. I have a couple kids that left and are at Indiana right now studying music at performance. I have a student that went to Marshall. We've had students that go to schools in Arkansas, Oklahoma, Louisiana. Uh, and we even have some that decide ultimately after they get done with their Bachelor of Arts that they want to explore something else and go into uh, other degrees, we had a, mm -hmm. have a student that's in occupational therapy and a program in <laughs> North Carolina right now. So, uh, but the great thing about the music degree, even if you choose not to maybe specialize in music after you get out of college, because sometimes students go to college to figure out what they really want to do. They don't know mm -hmm. in high school. Mm -hmm. And so if you wanted to go to law school or med school or even go into uh, occupational therapy and say the medicine field, but maybe not med school per se, the music degree is looked on very highly because they know the amount of work it takes to get a music degree, the amount of dedicated practice you have to do and things like that. Uh, I mean, how much do you recommend that a student practice? As much as they can. I mean, um, but what, what does that mean? What, typically, what? if I have a student that really wants to try to be a performer and have the ability to go to grad school, and I'm not talking just when I meet with the student, I don't want them just to be able to get in anywhere. I want them to have their choice of the top schools in the country. And so three hours on average is probably around where we're, we're three looking. Three hours a day, a day. A day. When I was in school, I mean, I was a little bit of an exception because I I just was voracious about music. I probably lived in a practice room and was there six or seven hours on my own a day. Looking back on it, I probably wasn't the smartest practicer. So um, oh, I try to help. There's smart practice. Oh, there's... there is definitely <laughs> smart practice, and there is practice where you just are beating your head against the wall and okay, not really. Well, we'll leave that right there because okay. we've got to take this break. We'll be back. History has become one of the most fought over battlegrounds in terms of shifting people's views and opinions about their country. In response to this, we have decided to launch a website called GoToHistory that will become your home for clear-eyed history content. Our objective is to put history out there free of agendas and allow you, the viewers, to decide what you believe and decide how to interpret this information. With experienced professors such as Dr. Don Frazier and Dr. Stephen Harden teaching courses and creating agenda-free content for students and just plain history enthusiasts, the content of Go-To History is vastly informative and unbiased. Hey history people, it's Phil Collins here. I am just giving a shout out to a couple of guys that you're going to be hearing from. Uh, and they're good friends of mine, but they're also incredibly knowledgeable historians. Dr. Donald Frazier and Dr. Stephen Hart. Both great friends of mine, both helped me out with my book on the Alamo. And two guys, if you don't know uh, much about history, these are the first two guys you should go to. Okay? What they don't know isn't worth knowing. Don Frazier, Steve Hart, and I hope you enjoy their presentations. My name is Evan Williams, a history major at McMurray University, and I love the layout of the GoTo website. I mean, it is singularly built from the ground up with user convenience in mind. Every study available is within a single courses tab, with each lesson having a single page for each of its individual videos, text, visuals, and quizzes, all at easy grasp. This is most definitely history made simple. 
please log on to www.gotohistory.com. Hello, and welcome back to the Professor's Podcast. And I am Christopher Bartlett, filling in for Dr. Frazier. I'm Paul Fabricio. And, you know, everybody, it's a lot of fun doing this podcast, but... Uh, it's also a lot of fun receiving donations and we have a Patreon that is set up and something as little as a dollar can go a long way. Like I'll show you right now the principle of how you can do it. Our production assistants are laughing. It's kind of hard to keep the serious. Mr. P uh, editor, can you focus in on this dollar to make sure it's real? No, not right now, but later. So here you go. This is for donation to their wow our Patreon. wow our, our literally color. literally that simple of course you have to do electronically but yeah. that's the same principle so head on over to patreon and yeah and and please <laughs> donate to us <laughs> thank so, you christopher yeah thank you that's great yeah so we were talking with david amlong uh first off where does the name amlong come from i believe it's german heritage czech and then um that's really what I mostly know about it. My my wife does more of the genealogy <laughs> stuff, even on our side of the family. So, um, but I, from what I understand, Germany and Czechoslovakia. Is there music in it someplace? Not or that I'm aware family? of. That I can think we can find anywhere behind us. My dad was in architecture, so some of the mathematics, because mm -hmm. a lot of music is mathematics in a lot of ways. So, mm -hmm. um, that's kind of as close as we can come to finding any innate musical talent. My brother was also very musical, but. We, uh, we don't really have any professional or even that we know of amateur musicians in our background. Except for you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Nice. Setting the mold. The exception. Yeah. Nice. Uh, well, uh, what can you tell us about the recital coming up next week? Yeah. So be... we originally kind of conversed about the idea of uh, talking about the McMurray New Music Project, which is in its second year. Johnny Mendoza and I, he's a fellow colleague in the music department. He's our percussion instructor. Uh, we had wanted to do something where we exposed our students to new music, not only um, music that was current and maybe written in the last 10 years, but 100% new music, stuff that they could actually see a world premiere. And even we could talk them through the process of working with the composer or hosting what essentially is a competition for other composers worldwide to submit their works and then we get them chosen. So there's a website called, uh, I guess for lack of a better term, they call it the composer site. And so you go there and it's basically, you can put out what in the industry is called a call for scores. We ask based on certain criteria for composers to give us their work, submit it, and the opportunity is then it will be played by, uh, if you were chosen, by a professional musician in a live setting, and they'll get a recording of the actual piece that they wrote. We did it last year. Uh, we had four categories. There were mostly trumpet and percussion related, so we did that, and it went really, really well. This year, we expanded it to six different categories. All include piano accompaniment this year, so we have trumpet, uh, percussion, mallet percussion, so a keyboard percussion instrument. We have flute oboe, voice, uh, all with piano accompaniment. And then we also have a chamber category where we ask the composers uh, if they were interested to write a piece including every single instrument with optional voice. Voice seemed a little bit hard to integrate uh, with the other instruments, so we left them the option of either spoken voice or if they wanted to add a vocal part to it. Ultimately, the one we chose did not have a vocal part to it. But um, So we select winners. The performers, who are all McMurray faculty, get the opportunity to give criteria. We basically put online a PDF form that says we want the music to stay within this certain amount of range. This These actually instruments. So for trumpet, it could have been trumpet, flugelhorn, uh, maybe possibly piccolo trumpet. Uh, for percussion, it was keyboard. For flute, it could have been flute, alto flute, piccolo, bass flute, things like that, mm -hmm. English horn or oboe. And then the composers get typically a range uh, guideline, so high or so low on the actual instrument. And then they are free to kind of write whatever they want and then submit it to us. It all comes in via email. And then I compile it. 
on a Google Drive folder, share it with everybody, and then each individual performer gets to review it and based on their own um, selection criteria, decide which piece they would like to perform. This year we had 95 different um, pieces, submissions wow, for, uh, in good. all six categories. Yeah, we went from around 60 the first year with the trumpet and percussion up to 95. Uh, we got things from um, South America, Asia, Europe, uh, obviously North America. Uh, I don't think we got any from Australia or uh, any from Africa, but we get worldwide submissions where they send us their things. Uh, the only basic criteria that they have to fit is it has to be unpremiered, so meaning it can have been written in the past, but it's never been publicly performed. Uh, that's really the only thing that we ask them to follow, and then we select the winners. So we have that coming up Tuesday night. Uh, rehearsals have begun with the accompanist and then putting the chamber piece together, and we're really looking forward to sharing new music with Abilene and recording it and putting it on the Internet as well. Nice. Yeah, and it is, it is open to the public. Yeah, the concert is completely open to the public, 7.30 on Tuesday um, the 5th of February in Ryan Recital Hall, basically mm. Hunt and Sales, the corner across from Aldersgate United Methodist or Church. Uh, and so, yeah, completely open to the public. Typically, the recital takes around an hour. We went from four pieces to six this year, so it's going to be maybe a little bit longer. But, uh, yeah, it's completely open, and we hope we have a really good audience. Nice. All right. What do you look for? To make that kind of choice. Yeah. I mean, you, you've got 95 <laughs> pieces. How uh -huh. do you sit there? I mean, do, do, well, they, so they, they send you the music the, yeah. written on a piece of paper. Yeah. So basically what we usually get is it all electronic format. So they'll send us a score, meaning the, the piano plus instrumental part. Uh, we ask for a composer biography and then a brief description of the piece. And we ask them to send us some sort of an audio recording, whether uh -huh. they send us MIDI, which is electronic format, the computer mm -hmm. playing something, or they may be, uh, if they play the instrument, we've had submissions where they play, play the piece themselves. Usually they do a reasonably good job. Um, they're usually not per, uh, professional performers. So mm -hmm. the recordings they send kind of, are close to what they want, but they know they need a professional to fully mm -hmm. realize it. So we usually will sit down with the score and um, first of all, make sure it fits in with the the range qualifications. Make sure it. I have to do a little bit of research and make sure the pieces haven't actually been performed. You'd be surprised if you give people directions not to send stuff that's published. We get stuff that you can go on Amazon and actually buy. I don't know <laughs> why, but they send us that, and that obviously gets immediately excluded or disqualified. But after that, it's really you sit down and uh, either print or open the score up on your computer, and you listen. You listen to the piece, uh, see what you particularly like about it. You read the description, what the composer was trying to do, how well is he able to accurately convey his feelings and the kind of his thoughts on what his message was, and does the music actually uh, realize that? in audio format to show my ignorance of things mm -hmm. someone sends an electronic copy of it mm -hmm. your computer can play it yeah so it's midi digital digital interface i'm not i think it's musical instrument digital interface is what midi stands for and so we can actually have computer programs that when i want to write a piece of music i can put it in the computer see all the dots on the right mm -hmm. staves and everything in the computer will Tell me what it pl it'll sound exactly. It can sound almost the the quality is so well, and the uh, instrument interfaces are so advanced that really it can sound like a concert band just by putting your computer on. There's never going to be a full substitute for having a live band in front of you and actually playing right. your music. But yeah, it gets really uh, close to what you think it will sound. Even the instruments sound very realistic. And then there's a way you can check to see that it hasn't been already published. That's so a little is, harder. Is, is it like the digital equivalent of turnitin.com to well, catch, catch cheating? Well, what I typically have to do is take the composer's name and his uh, the name of his piece, and then I'll Google it to see okay. if there's a professional recording, if there's even an amateur recording that somebody has put on YouTube. 
uh, maybe a recital concert they've put on there. Sometimes on their websites, you can find that it lists that it has been performed at a certain time at a certain venue. Uh, occasionally, you put in the piece in the title, and it will send you a link to Amazon, like I said, where you can actually buy the piece. So it's already published. Uh, we had one submitted that was written for the principal oboe player of the New York Philharmonic, which is great, <laughs> except for it doesn't really follow the idea of written for did uh, they the for, contest. Did they forget that well, they had already published it? No, or? I think what composers at times do is they really want their music played by as much audience as possible. And so they go on the composer site and see that there's a call for scores and they might submit okay. anything they've ever written that okay. potentially falls in the guidelines, even though if we do our homework, we have to exclude it because they didn't follow the rules. Wow. Yeah. It's a little bit of legwork to go through. And I usually wait until our artists pick exactly which pieces they want to be the winners. And that's where I'll go the night before we actually announce and start investigating to see. And there were several both years that we picked a winner and then found out already been played, maybe even Whoops. been recorded. And so we have to go to mm. choice B or C. And so it wow. happens. You got to be careful. You got to do your work. Yeah. We we try to make sure the spirit of the competition is followed because we're we're trying to expose our students to new music, but also help new composers get their music yeah. out there. And if somebody who's that's wide important. known and already has their music published, that's really in some ways against the spirit of the competition. All right, we'll be back. Welcome to State House Press, a nonprofit publisher of quality books. Statehouse Press and the McWinney Foundation Press are part of the Texas A&M University Press Consortium, which handles retail distribution for several small but distinguished publishers. Our entire list of offerings, with pictures, summaries, prices, and easy online ordering, is available in our section of the Consortium website. Statehouse Press is proud of its reputation for high standards of scholarship and readability. In addition to this, we at Statehouse Press have recruited the talents of individuals such as Phil Collins on his book, The Alamo and Beyond. We release not only Texana by contemporary authors, but reprints of classic accounts of Texas life and history otherwise inaccessible to the public. Our book list also incorporates the publications of the McWinney Foundation Press, specializing in the history of the Old South and the Civil War. We strive with our titles to make history accessible to as many readers as possible. To accomplish this task, we have recruited some of America's leading historians, as well as bright new scholars. We believe firmly in narrative history, in telling a good story, and in telling it well, without losing sight of the people who've made history and the events that changed the nation. For questions or business inquiries, please visit the Texas Book Consortium at www.tamupress.com. When you support McWinney History Education Group, you also support the many young workers who operate and maintain the company's digital operations. These are dedicated university students who handle many things such as filming, recording, and editing content for McWinney, as well as cultivate the layout and structure of McWinney's various websites, including its associated channel on YouTube. We are a nonprofit organization that exists from donations from interested persons and history enthusiasts alike. Donations enable our students to obtain a higher education, job training, and career bolstering skills. If you would like to donate, please visit us at www.mcwinney.org and click on our About Us tab to learn more. Bear Leader Tours Where will Bear Leader Tours take you? Everywhere. Paris. Rouge. Trier. Battlefields, Pearl Harbor, Pacific Beaches, Louisiana, Guadalcanal, Rome. Join the adventure. www.mcwinnie.org This portion of the show is reserved for advertisements. If you are interested in filling this portion with ads for your business, please call 325-793-4686 or email director at tfhcc.com. Hello and welcome back to the Professor's Podcast. I'm Christopher Bartlett here with 
I'm Paul Fabrizio. And our guest today is David Amlong. Well, we need to say Dr. David. Dr. David. You don't have to say that. And, so and I apologize. No, no, that's we, fine. I'm, I'm not that kind of doctor, so it doesn't really matter. <laughs> <laughs> but you have a doctorate. I do, yeah. And so I think that's something to be recognized, and, oh. you know. So anyway, Christopher. Well, you have a lot you've mentioned. You have a lot going on in your department these next few weeks, one of which is a uh, residency. What yeah, can you tell us about that? Yeah, we have John Rommel coming down from Indiana University, who is my major field teacher during my doctoral studies. He's actually somebody I've known since high school. I took a lesson with him in high school, and then uh, I auditioned at IU for every degree, just didn't go. But one of the things we try to do at McMurray is expose our students not only to the great faculty we have. You mentioned a doctorate. I think every single one of our people on faculty, especially full-time, have doctorates in music, and so which doesn't always happen, especially mm -hmm. at small music, smaller music programs. Mm -hmm. uh, but we like to bring uh, world-renowned guest artists. We've had uh, guests from Baylor University, University of Oklahoma, uh, Belmont in Nashville, uh, Ohio State University. We bring as many people as we can to campus. Uh, we ultimately firmly believe in our abilities to guide our students to whatever they want to do in music, but it's also great to expose them to other outside influences who ideally we also respect their opinions and talents. So I have John Rommel coming from uh, Bloomington, Indiana for uh, a residency and also part of what we call now McMurray Trumpet Fest. It used to be called Trumpet Day and I'd have an all-day Saturday event for high school and college kids. And that eventually got to where kids by five o'clock after being there for eight hours were yawning and taking, seemed like they were just too tired. So I'm doing it a little differently this year. We're having a youth night next Friday on the eighth where um, John's going to give a master class for high school and middle school students. We're going to have a UIL solo and ensemble showcase. So those students preparing to go to solo and ensemble are going to get to play on stage at McMurray with a piano player if necessary and get written feedback from John and myself. And then there's a closing concert Friday night that John will play on our McMurray trumpet ensemble will play. We have a McMurray student who won a student competition to be featured and I'll play a piece as well. Uh, so that's coming up next week. Uh, we also then will go to the Texas Music Education Association Conference. I'm playing with the Key City Brass and also the Lone Star State Trumpet Guild. We started an affiliate chapter of the International Trumpet Guild in the West Texas region. So uh, Odessa, San Angelo, Abilene, and we have another showcase performance we're doing down at the convention as well. Later in the year, we have our chanters are going to perform with the Abilene Philharmonic doing the Mozart Requiem. We have a marimba madness, essentially a percussion festival. Uh, and the great thing about these residencies as well is not only do our students get to hear these guys play, or women, depending who we bring in, they get to hear these professionals play. But it often involves a private lesson for every single one of them, multiple master classes for all of our students, whether they play brass instruments or not, to attend. And they get a really diverse background of material and great educational resource because like with John in particular, he can talk to those students about if you want to go and get a master's degree in music and look at Indiana, here's the things we might look about for an audition panel or something like that. And mm -hmm. so we're really trying to expose them as much as possible to outside influences. And that's, it's pretty unique. I've been plenty of uh, places where, and seen a lot of posters and things where you don't get as many on-campus events. Maybe you take a group to a, another college or you go somewhere and see a master class, but to have those people come to Abilene and work with our students is something we really pride ourselves with at the music department and give them as much uh, educational resources as we can. Mm -hmm. Now, now right. let me, no, if, if it's all right, yeah, I, I want to veer off in a totally different direction. Yeah. A student comes to you and their goal is to play in the mili one of the military mm -hmm. bands. Yeah. And you went through most of that process. Yeah. How do you go about doing that? Because I'm, I must admit, I always thought that the military simply took whoever walked in the door and then they yeah. threw an instrument at, instrument at it and said, play it. Well, and if you can play it, you got to march and play. But well, how does it work? It, so the, the music scene in the army bands and uh, so the military system in, in general now is really highly advanced. Uh, if a student came to me and ultimately wanted to get into that, you could walk into a recruiter's office and say, I want to play in a band. I played in high school band. Uh, I'm just going to enlist. Please put me in an army band. Well, 
The problem with doing that is you're probably, if you even get put in a band, are going to get put somewhere where music is not your primary focus. You're a soldier first. And mm -hmm. so if you really want to get a music specialized uh, arena in position, it's an audition process just like any other. If you wanted to be a professional musician in an orchestra, you they announce an audition, they announce what they want you to play, and you prepare it and you show up and essentially interview or audition for the job. It's the same way in the military band system now. Hmm. Often the premier bands, they have certain bands that they call premier bands that are stationed mostly in Washington, D.C. Those are the bands that uh, they say if we were to go to war and they needed every hand on deck that they are the last ones to be called and work as soldiers, which is good because they're musicians. They're not trained right. soldiers. I mean, they're playing the trumpet, not holding a machine gun. So right. it's probably not the best person you want out on the front lines. But um, often what they ask is uh, a recording ahead of time, a pre-screened audition recording. They'll ask, often they'll even tell you what to play give you a certain list and you make a recording, you send that recording in anymore. When we say a recording, it's all done digitally. You send mm -hmm. all your stuff either through a Dropbox folder or you make a YouTube video and you send it mm -hmm. to them. They review it and then they might invite people to the audition. Um, the other way that you can do mm -hmm. an audition is what they call a cattle call audition, meaning mm -hmm. they make an audition uh, request and anybody can show up. Uh, it's done less frequently now because it costs a lot more and it's it's a great expense for the performer as well because you know, don't really know your chances. So you mm -hmm. to just show up, it can be really expensive to fly to Washington, D.C., also get hotel rooms. And mm -hmm. when you're talking yeah. trumpets, a rather small instrument, but if you're a double bass player, then you have to figure out a way to get your instrument with you as well. So maybe you have to drive all the way across the country because a bass mm -hmm. is pretty large to put on a plane. Yeah. So the audition process is – it's it's pretty thorough. You'll play almost everything on the list and then also have to do sight reading. Uh, it used to be that the military band system was looked at as maybe a backup career for many those people who wanted to be elite level uh, professional musicians. Not anymore. The level coming out of the top music schools in the world are the same people auditioning for orchestras, for the military band system. So it, what I would tell them is, um, if that's your goal, we want to sit down and get you in the practice room, refine your skills to where you are as good as possible, where you can compete with anybody in the world. And that's really the process. It's not a backup career anymore. It's, it's extremely competitive to get even into the military band system. Very good. Well, thank you so much, Dr. David Amlin. We're down <laughs> to our last 25 seconds. Okay. Do you have a final message for our listeners and viewers out there? Uh, I just want to, again, convey that I really think McMurray is a great place to work and study, and our music department is thriving. We're, we're growing. We have great scholarship opportunities, and if anybody is interested, even if you don't want to major in music and all you want to do is participate in band to, or choir, to give us a, a call, get a hold of us via email, and let us know, and we can give you as much information as we have and hopefully get you at McMurray to participate. Thank you very much, Thank and you. class dismissed. Mm -hmm.